Joining the other link now. Good morning, everyone. We'll give everyone a couple more minutes. We just had a long uh, board meeting. So for those of you joining us, we'll give everyone another minute or two for our board members to convene. And we'll get started. How are we looking for committee members? Are you back or is it still Mayor Beth? No, I'm here. Um, still waiting on a few more. Looks like there's only four on right now. Looks like Roger. Jack, Skaggs. Bill Talon. Yep. Stack. He is on. Yep, yep. He's okay. on. I'm just it's missing Green like and Jones. Now. Yep, Brevy Jones and is and Commissioner Womack. Womack, okay. Pam, while we're waiting, can you scroll up on that just one second sure. so I can write down a couple things? Sure. This helps me keep track. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yep, that's good. Can you make me? I can't. I can't. <sighs> right there, that's the problem. And then do we know who's giving each of these updates, Waymond? Am I just calling on you for all of these? Or? Yes, I'll do that. And I'll uh, direct the particular staff members that have uh, <laughs> items on them. Okay. That, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, let's get started. I hope my other three commissioners are on by now. Well, we're going to welcome everyone today to the um, August CARE subcommittee. It is an open meeting. Uh, Wayman, since we are virtual, will you please read the guidance? 
Yes, I will. Uh, pursuant to Governor Whitmer's Executive Order 2021-54, the Kent County Board of Commissioners COVID Relief Subcommittee, in order to protect the public health, will conduct this meeting today via electronic communications. Any member of the public wishing to listen to the proceedings or provide public comment may do so by using the internet connection or phone numbers and passcode that's listed on the agenda. Uh, it was sent out as well. Anyone disrupting the meeting by using offensive language or offensive actions will be muted from the call and or removed from the meeting. Uh, you may send public comment to email address public comment at kentcountymi.gov. Great, thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone. We haven't met since July. Um, we have a lot to talk about. I think this meeting and next meeting will be very critical in um, assessing what programs are, are, um, are still in need if we have to readjust. So with that, I will move on to item two of the agenda, approval of the minutes from July 23rd meeting. Do I have a motion? Moved by Brevi. Support by Jones. Moved by Commissioner Brevi, support by Commissioner Jones. Questions or comments on the minutes? I don't see any. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Minutes are approved. We are on to item three, the small business recovery program update. Wait a minute. And, uh, Madam Chair, in your packet, you have an overall update, which includes uh, from staff an update on the business recovery program. Uh, the Chamber of Grand Rapids is here. Dante Villarreal, I think, uh, is, is on the call. He will provide a quick update and then uh, any additional uh, updates and questions uh, needed by staff will follow that. So I'll turn it over to Dante Villaria in the Rapids Chamber. Great. Good morning, Good Dante. Morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Thank you for the opportunity to give a brief update. Um, I'll go ahead and, and get right into it. Um, as many of you know, uh, on June 22nd, we started uh, accepting applications for the King County Small Business Recovery Program. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased where we are today with, with the program. Um, we have received uh, over 2,400 applications. Uh, these uh, 24 applications um, have all come uh, electronically um, through our um, intake form that we have. We do have out of the uh, 2,400 applications that we have received, um, we have very strong um, uh, equity numbers. Um, the, the Caucasian white demographic is represented by 33.75% of, of all applicants. African American um, are represented by 25.9% of, of all applicants. Hispanic Latino, 13%. Asian, uh, Asian American, 11.5%. Uh, Multiracial, 7.97%. Um, we have six, about 6% 6 that no, do not answer, 1.34% um, for Middle Eastern and 0.21% Native American. Um, these, uh, these businesses are represented by a variety of different industries, and I'd like to share what the percentages are. 48.6% uh, are service industries, 20% uh, um, do not specify, 16.2% uh, are food or beverage, 11.2% are retail, and 2.1% are manufacturing. Uh, we are also tracking childcare, and which is at 1%. Uh, <coughs> um, this represents over 10,000 uh, employees. The, 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 the businesses that um, have applied uh, represent a collective of over 10,000 employees. Um, and, uh, and we are, um, well, and, and over uh, 12,000 full-time equivalents uh, employees. Um, all uh, of King County's zip codes have received uh, applications, so we are extremely happy uh, with that. Um, <clears throat> we are about uh, uh, halfway there through the program, uh, or, or actually a little more than halfway. Um, Eleven million dollars have been has been approved with about a uh, little over $9 million uh, being um, cut in checks uh, for our recipients. Um, and we do have about $4 million in the pipeline right now in applications. So uh, if that comes uh, to fruition in the next week or two, um, we're, we're definitely uh, 
above the $15 million um, uh, 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 location. So it, I would say that it, there's about $10 million uh, left, maybe um, four to five more weeks of, of accepting applications and, and getting um, people through, through the program. Um, still today, uh, we are coming across many, many, many businesses that um, have not heard about it or have not fully understood or really do not see themselves as uh, qualifying businesses, even though they are hurting and very negatively impacted. So um, we are continuing to, uh, to be very intentional in marketing um, this program to our King County uh, business community. Um, I'll share with you uh, part of the success that we've had up to now is a result of a very aggressive and intentional marketing and outreach campaign. Um, we have, um, we've had over 50 uh, media hits um, on this program and since uh, June 22nd when the program began. We do have, um, th these earned media hits are, are really um, important because it allows us to, to let others see what we are doing and not just the, the marketing or, or uh, paid advertising that we have. Um, we do, we have contracted with um, marketing uh, organizations um, and, and utilized um, partners and, and other vendors to get the word out there. Um, we've, we've invested over $70,000 in, in direct engagement um, in our outreach efforts. Um, about 85% of all of these, this investment has been with minority or women owned firms. So um, we're, we're, very, we're being very intentional there. Um, our outreach efforts also includes uh, uh, many clinics, both virtual and in person. Um, we've had the opportunity to even join some of uh, you, uh, our local county commissioners, and visit um, many, many of the businesses in, in our, in our uh, community. Um, our clinics um, are not only during business hours, but also um, after biz traditional business hours um, and on the weekends, and not just Saturdays, but Sundays as well. Um, we understand that businesses have different schedules and different uh, uh, availability, and we're being very intentional um, there. Um, I want to I want to share with you that um, the impact is is in, in, it's it's incredible. It's it's intense. Um, um, I've had the I've, I personally have had the opportunity to visit um, hundreds of businesses in these last couple of months, and um, the the need is real and the need is is urgent. Um, so we're we're happy to continue it. We do have a, a short video testimonial of somebody who's been through the process. Uh, this is one of our local um, uh, businesses that has, has been severely uh, impacted by the economic conditions of COVID. They were closed and now they're um, partially open. Um, but uh, Pam, I'm gonna ask you if you can please share the, um, the video. I don't think the volume is on. Can you hear the volume? No volume, we'll have to start it over. I do hope some of you are not hungry right now because... Um... <laughs> Try it again. I think that might be one of my favorite restaurants downtown, so. Hola, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Paola Mendivil. Soy coordinadora de banquetes para mi negocio familiar, el granjero Mexican Grill. Estamos muy emocionados de haber sido aceptado para el programa de apoyo para los pequeños negocios del condado de Kent. March 16 of 2020, El Granjero Mexican Grill closed its doors for dining because of the pandemic. And immediately we started to see the consequences. Our sales dropped 75%. 
our catering side of the business stopped completely with many events being canceled and postponed. Additionally, we went from 25 employees to five employees working, but we continue to be hopeful. And now with the grant, we will be able to pay our employees, our team members, our vendors, and make sure that we move forward with our business. Right now, I know there's a lot of fear and uncertainty, but working together, we can make sure we move our economy forward, our families are safe and healthy, and we want to continue to be part of this neighborhood, of this great city that I'm proud to call my home for the last 15 years. Más que un regalo monetario, el programa de apoyo para pequeños negocios del condado de Kent nos ha dado a El Granjero Mexican Grill la fuerza y la esperanza para continuar con nuestras puertas abiertas y servir a nuestra comunidad. Thank you, thank you, Pam. Um, this is one of, of a handful of videos that um, we, the chamber is releasing to uh, to again um, create awareness about the program and and really help businesses here in, in King County understand that this is for them. Uh, this is their lifeline. This is this is their opportunity to um, get back uh, on track. Um, we are still very much in the middle of this global pandemic. We're we're not out of the woods yet. Um, businesses continue to hurt each and every day. Um, we here at the chamber are seeing many businesses continue to close their doors, um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, the, uh, the the turmoil that's happening in other sectors of of, of our lives is is also impacting um, businesses in in a very big way. Um, this program could not have uh, come at a, at a better um, time to, to be, again, that lifeline that the businesses need. So, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to open it up to, to any questions that anyone may have. Great, thank you, Dante. The, the statistics were, I think, exactly what we were looking for. It is so nice to get that feedback from those businesses. I wish you could do 100 videos because <laughs> um, it would be a great way to get the word out as well. But. Um, really appreciate that. Any questions for uh, Dante today? Can we chat? Don't see any. And this is this is Commissioner Stack. Yep. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Dante, uh, for your work. Having um, having been involved with you in some of these presentations, uh, you, you do a great job of, of demonstrating not only the value of it, but how simple and easy it is for businesses to submit an application to engage this process. Um, so, which I think is a key part of this, being able to make sure that particularly small businesses that don't, um, don't relish the opportunity to engage uh, with government on more regulations and, uh, and activities. So, uh, thank you. I think that does have a big impact on the, uh, on the receptiveness of this program. Um, so my, my uh, I guess my follow-up question is, again, you've indicated that we're a little over 50%. We've got a fair number of these uh, applications still in the hopper. Um, how long can we continue to take applications and uh, assuming that we have not spent out the money yet, but how long can we continue to take applications and meet the spending deadlines? Um, I would say that we're we're probably a good four weeks um, into uh, from, from closing down the application. Um, as we're going to get, as we get closer to drawing down the money, um, we will start to gauge. Well, should we open it up for, keep it at for the next 500 applications or 300? And and you know we we don't want individuals applying going through the process without us not having the funding. So um, we are estimated around four to five additional weeks. Um, but every week we can have an update to know where we are exactly from that um, from that spend down. Um, so we can communicate that appropriately, not only, not only to the county, but to the community at, at large. Um, the next phase of, of outreach and, and marketing is, is a very one-on-one -on -one, um, focus or, or intentionality. Um, there are industries, we're, we're canvassing um, our application pool, and there are industries that are not represented as strongly. Um, there's some geographic areas as well, some um, demographics as well that uh, we want to be intentional in making sure that uh, they they are getting the information to to apply. I also want to encourage everyone on the subcommittee um, and and the uh, board of commissioners at large. If anybody would like to um, have a virtual clinic, 
uh, or do any type of specific outreach to a, a, a constituency that you might have, we're happy to do that. Uh, we have the team here in place to, to, to work alongside with you as we've done with uh, Commissioner Stick um, and Commissioner Womack, who has um, really be, been so intentional in, in getting out there uh, to his community. And, and again, we have a team ready to, to support as well. Uh, my follow-up question, uh, Dante, is uh, I think that most of the applications are, are being processed and are approved. Uh, is there a particular um, reason for those that are not approved? Is there something that uh, that comes back repeatedly that's an issue that keeps them from qualifying? Yeah, um, there, there's nothing um, in particular per se. Uh, what, what we're finding is that because we're spending a lot of time on the front end helping them with the application and um, get the financial and so forth, um, the, the percentage of, of those that are being denied are very low. But of those, it, it might come down to um, um, just not having all the information or the information does not is not making sense uh, showing an impact um, and so we are circling back with the few that are being denied and helping them uh, kind of regroup not to have to reapply um, but looking at it like a second round of review to say is there something here that this review committee missed that this other review committee might might be able to uh, to have, uh, to get to a different outcome um, we do that though by making sure we have additional information that whatever was missing, whatever the re the initial review committee um, states as the reason for not recommending for funding, um, we address that. And if there is no way to address it, then you know it is a process that does does um, deny folks as it's designed to do that. They don't meet all the um, criteria um, that that are really showing the impact that they've had. Some industries. For some businesses have not seen a decline. You know, you saw Paola with El Granjero, you know, 75% loss of income, right? You know, pretty straightforward. And we do have some industries or some businesses that have grown their, their income just because they're selling something that, it, that is in demand. Um, and we, we still look and, and make sure that um, there isn't anything that is negatively impacting that would still make them qualify, but sometimes that's, that's not the case. Well, taking it one more step, I know that we, you make the recommendation to the county, the county does the final. Um, are, are we seeing a number of them that you recommend that the county ultimately is not approving? Um, and if so, why? Uh, no, we're not. Um, everything that you're, that once it's gone through our process through the review committees, um, the county does review it um, and, and but pretty much everything is being approved by, by the county. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Jones, you did have your hand up. Did we answer a question nope. for you? I still do have my hand okay. up. Thank you, Chair. Yep. So I was curious, just ballparking, how many of these grants are the $20,000 amount? Mm -hmm. So that would be probably the minority. Um, most are, uh, so the average, um, the average grant size is about 8,000. If we, if we were to, um, average it out. Most are between five and ten thousand dollars. That's the majority, and then followed by fifteen and twenty are are on the lower end. So um, this is a question more for Chair Bolter and our committee. But I'm curious if we've thought about, or if the chamber can chime in. Have you had? Any, so let me start with this. Have you had any feedback about companies that might be slightly larger? that would like to access something along these lines? So I, I would respond by, by saying, yes, we've, we've definitely had a uh, larger company say, you know what, I, I don't quite fit it, but I'm, but I'm hurting um, as well. So yes, we have had that. We've also had other industries, um, you know, tech industries that um, uh, maybe are, are only, you know, 15, 20 employees, um, but 15,000, 20,000 might not really impact them as much or help them as much. So, you know, it, we knew that every industry is different. I think this program addresses the, the majority, but there's those um, other industries that might, might still require more, more support. Um, what we also find out is the, the larger the employee count, the more likely they would have already um, accessed other resources or PPP or, or anything like that. Um, 
but but I will say there was something that that I probably missed in, in the beginning was how long the hurt would last. Um, I was, in, in my mind, I was hoping, you know, this is back in May when we began discussions on this. I was hoping that by the end of summer, we would see our economy turning around. Um, and, and we are starting to see a little bit, but but the, the hurt is still, it, it it's prolonged and there's no end in sight. Um, Well, Commissioner Bolter, just for future discussion, whether we keep this as is or we look at adjusting this relief fund, I just wanted to put that in the mix as something we might need to add as more discussion topics. Yeah, I think for our September meeting, Dante, if, if you think, you know, depending on if we change that date, but that would be approximately four weeks out. So if you, you know, we may have a situation where the buckets that we allocated have some lapse money or we need to reallocate something. Maybe we look at establishing possibly like a different type of criteria um, if we had funding left. So I'm certainly open to it. I know our, our, our board, our committee probably is as well. I'll get that feedback from them, but um, we would want to hear from you if we're kind of, you know, really glad you're tracking in almost real time where the money, you know, mm -hmm. is and where we're at in our status. Commissioner mm -hmm. Steck. There I am. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and maybe this can come up at the at the um, next section that we're going to address the nonprofits, but I just want to make sure we're not having a gap here between uh, our employers, our small employers who are nonprofits versus the small employers who are for-profit. And my recollection understanding is that this program would not be a program made available to nonprofits who have less than 25 FTE. They would be directed to the nonprofit program where we're hoping that the same kind of, uh, of resource would be made available to that program. Do I, do I have that right? Correct, though, um, I think the nonprofit uh, program is structured slightly different, and, and we'll get to that on item four of the agenda. Yeah, again, I just wanted to make sure we don't have them, because I get asked, I'm sure everybody gets asked uh, about where do the nonprofits go when they have the same kinds of needs and concerns that our for-profits have. So sure. we'll deal with that with the next one. Commissioner Talon. Commissioner Taylor, did you have a question? I'm not hearing. Oh, sorry. Now you can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a follow-up question, perhaps, uh, uh, that applies to both the Small Business Relief Fund, I think, and the nonprofits. Um, what my understanding was that the funding could be used for direct COVID expenses. And I'm hearing that perhaps the uh, definition of that has been broadened a bit. I guess I'm asking for some clarification either from Dante for this fund or from staff. Um, does it include more than kind of those direct costs for personnel or equipment? Um, or is there some additional COVID impact like loss of revenue that is also eligible for reimbursement? I don't know if that's a, that's a question for Linda or, or Warner. Warner or from uh, Linda, one of the two, perhaps they could weigh in on that for you. Warning, the uh, COVID regulations require that any expense be tied back to COVID. So while there is flexibility and especially in the chamber program, there is room for business interruption um, coverage, uh, that everything does have to be tied back to COVID in some form. Hey, Linda, could you turn your volume up just a little bit too so we can hear you a little bit clearer, if you could. Thank you. Okay, I, I appreciate that clarification because in my mind that's considerably different than what I heard early on in our process, that business interruption is pretty broad and my assumption is that that's um, what we're operating under for the nonprofit uh, fund as well. Nonprofit fund was geared more toward supporting programming into the community 
as opposed to supporting the agencies themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of a distinction between the for-profits and the non-profits. Okay, I'll wait to hear about that when we get to that section. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on item three of the agenda? I don't see any hands raised in the... All right. Let's move on to item four, the nonprofit assistance program update. Linda, could you take the lead on that and please uh, give us a high level overview and then uh, entertain questions from the subcommittee from there. Sure. In, the, in the report that was attached to the agenda, you see the summary of where this program is right now. Unfortunately, our, our representatives from the United Way had a conflict at 1030, so they had to ju jump off already. But you will see that we are receiving um, a, a increasing number of applications and we're moving an increasing number of grants through the system since last month because this one um, was a little bit behind uh, the chamber program but it is ramping up considerably um, if the committee review committee at the united way uh, meets uh, um, at least once a week um, county staff sits in on those meetings the uh, applications go through the process they're confirmed to tie back to COVID. The recommendations then come over to the county and the uh, communication goes out to the recipients of, of the award at that point. Um, as it shows in the report, um, we're up to 151 recommendations, which is an increase of 103 over last month. And um, we've got 68 grants uh, totaling about $2.4 million with an additional 25 um, and many others in the, in the pipeline. So awarded to date is approximately $4 million. Not all of that is yet out the door because we're waiting for information from the recipients. Um, the federal guidance uh, is now requiring us to get additional information from recipients, including DUNS numbers, but we're working our way through that. We've added some additional staff from our outside auditors to try and uh, speed up this process and get the money out to the community. Could you also Linda, tie into that the child care uh, grant program and then possibly the housing component as well? So. Sure, actually Matt Nelson is on the phone as well and he's been um, one of the leads on the child care. So I'll let him uh, handle the child care. And he's also got uh, the summary of the legal research on the housing. Oh, thank you, uh, Linda. And thank you uh, subcommittee for um, uh, allowing us to, to discuss this with you today. The, with regard to the child care program, uh, last, uh, the last subcommittee meeting, uh, we indicated that we had an upcoming meeting with First Steps Kent. Uh, we had that meeting and during those discussions, First Steps Kent um, on behalf of the, uh, the child care community identified really three basic areas of needs uh, for, the, uh, for daycare providers uh, in particular throughout the county. Uh, the first of those was for direct financial assistance. Uh, these providers were suffering financially from uh, the shutdown uh, caused by the shutdown of industry caused by uh, COVID and the, uh, the subsequent uh, not having kids in daycare. Uh, the second was with regard to PPE to be able to provide safe, safely provide uh, daycare services. And then the third was with regard to materials and some additional services. And I'll get back to those in a moment. As we talked to First Steps Kent, and then they talked back with the, um, uh, the organizations in this area that they uh, regularly deal with uh, through the Essential Needs Task Force, you know, Task Force and other agencies, uh, we identified the fact that the direct financial assistance could be most easily provided through the uh, small business relief program that the Grand Rapids Chamber was already operating. And so we connected First Steps Kent and uh, the Chamber through Dante and the chamber has done a number of workshops uh, to uh, ensure that people are applying to that program. Uh, daycare providers are applying to that program and there were actually more resources available to day daycare providers through that program than there would be if we limited it to the $1.2 million allocation here. Uh, First Steps Kent was, and the other organizations to my understanding are very pleased with that approach. We did the same thing with regard to PPE uh, with the, uh, the county's uh, back to work PPE program. And uh, there is, a, I think, a, an overall agreement that that too is, um, has been uh, meeting the needs for daycare providers um, in, a, in a manner that's, uh, uh, that's, that's been sufficient and adequate and their needs for PPE has been reduced. They do have needs for some specific types of PPE 
as well as uh, impermeable supplies. It can be sanitized, especially toys. Uh, and they needed uh, older age materials uh, for the older kids who are coming into daycare, uh, as well as some help with some additional services. First Steps Kent provided uh, the county with a proposal uh, for $450,000 to address these needs. Uh, and that agreement is in the works. Uh, we're at the final stages of that, and I would expect that that will be handled uh, here in the, within the next couple of days uh, before Labor Day, um, I would say at the latest. So I think we're, uh, we're in good shape there. Um, and I'll turn it back to Linda. Oh, excuse me, Linda, you asked me to talk about the, um, uh, the legal issues or, or the, 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 the housing as well. Yes, please. Yes. So with regard to housing, uh, there's two different pieces that were brought under this. Uh, the first was with regard to homelessness prevention, and the other was, uh, a deal, was, was with regard to addressing uh, folks who are both experiencing homelessness or uh, experiencing housing insecurity. So let me start with the first. Just as we were starting to have these conversations with different organizations, and in fact, literally 10 minutes after the conversation with one of the organizations that works in the eviction prevention space, the state announced that it was using its CARES Act dollars to launch an eviction diversion program, and it had a fully planned program working with uh, the counties. Uh, the, the HARAs, the housing, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, definition off the top of my head, but the, uh, the coordinators for uh, relief in each county. In Kent County, that's the Salvation Army. So we turned and spoke to the Salvation Army about uh, whether there were gaps in that program and if the, uh, the county could come alongside to both expand the scope of coverage uh, through that program and also uh, lengthen the duration of the program if the funds were otherwise going to run out before December 30th. We had very good conversations with the Salvation Army around that, spoke, has spoken with other organizations who have agreed that, that this approach of supplementing uh, what is already set up by the state makes sense. It also takes us out of the business of having to identify what the, uh, uh, what the require, what requirements uh, would be for a full-fledged program because the state has already done that. And so what we are doing is piggyback what we are intending to do, and that program is also in the works, subject to final approval, uh, is piggyback onto that program, ex expand uh, both the, uh, some of the, the caps so that we can help more Kent County residents, um, expanding the, the state program has a one-time payment only requirements and the Salvation Army is very concerned about that. So uh, we're also suggesting that it provide additional assistance for, for future payments if someone should again fall behind on rents. Uh, and in this way, we think that um, we can cost effectively um, uh, expand the, the range of uh, Kent County residents who will be able to receive benefits through the program. With regard to uh, homelessness prevention, uh, the focus has been on providing permanent solutions uh, in this area. And so there are a number of programs, both through KCCA uh, and other organizations that address obviously uh, a wide range of, of issues in this area. One of the issues that has been consistently brought, uh, brought up in conversations is the need for uh, additional affordable housing to be made available for people who, for the people who are, uh, who are experiencing housing insecurity have some place to end up. To that end, we have solicited proposals and now received them just uh, within the last few days uh, from four different organizations in Kent County, uh, from community rebuilders uh, in partnership with Link Up, uh, from ICCF, and from uh, AYA Youth Collective, which was formerly known as 311 and HQ. Uh, all of these are with regard to moving forward with projects that have been stalled because of the COVID-19 crisis uh, to ensure that there are additional, uh, there is additional affordable housing stock available for those who are suffering uh, from housing instability specifically caused by uh, or, or caused by the either uh, the COVID-19 directly or because of the economic instability caused by COVID-19. We are in the process of reviewing those proposals and um, we need to go back and, and get some clarifications on some things, but that is the, the current status there. We expect that that program, uh, that we'll have proposals, uh, we'll have proposals back for the county uh, with regard to all of that, uh, that the county staff and us will have proposals back to, uh, to Wayman and Mandy uh, with regard to those uh, sometime in the relatively near future. And with that, I think that covers, uh, Linda, is there anything that I've missed uh, that, uh, that needs to be covered with regard to those areas? No, I was just going to mention that the, I just 
mentioned that the document that uh, was provided in the packet has those details that Matt covered under on page four under housing. So we weren't able to show that, but that's on page four. Go ahead, Linda, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to thank Matt for the, uh, the report out. All right, looks like Commissioner Steck has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, again, again, following up with what I'd raised in the uh, in the last section and talking, um, as I look at at least the description of how we are implementing the 9.5 million that we've allocated here, it looks like most of it. Maybe, in fact, the only discussion here has to do with the programmatic requests to nonprofit community to identify various programs that they're offering to implement in the community to address COVID. Uh, we have. I don't know, but we have to have thousands of nonprofits and faith-based organizations uh, that function in this county that have many, many employees. And most of these entities function at a pretty tight budget. Um, and, and again, my thinking was that, uh, that this committee had some intentionality to provide some of these funds so that all of these entities uh, that are being impacted by these additional costs that they're incurring that they can't otherwise pass through would have a way of getting some relief, um, similarly to what our for-profits uh, are doing uh, for grants of up to $20,000. And and I guess I'm not seeing that yet here. Um, are, are the 151 applications, are those for ex COVID expense reimbursement grants or is that for program implementation grants? Or both, and if so, both. What what's the breakdown here? Matt, you sat in on yesterday's meeting with the New United Way, so you've got the freshest information. If you want to address that, so these are all of these grants are for program implementation, and they range. They have a much broader spectrum than does the uh, the chamber program. So it's ranging from five thousand dollars for some uh, small programs, all the way up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars to uh, to support uh, various uh, uh, programs that are being implemented to, to address, for example, one that came up yesterday, uh, the needs of uh, folks uh, whose uh, kids are not going back to school, they're, they're in virtual lo learning, uh, but, they're, uh, but they're, the parents work. And so uh, trying to provide programs to, uh, that would provide a place for them to be able to do uh, distance learning. So the, the, the answer, Commissioner Steck, to your question is it's all programmatic. Um, when we initially, um, when initially this was uh, adopted, um, the, we, we met with the, the United Way with regard to this program and talked about you know, how would this all work. Uh, and it was certainly uh, in consultation with them uh, that the program was developed to address essential needs in Kent County with regard to the funds. Uh, and not with regard to providing uh, funds to uh, nonprofits based on employee count, in part because um, a employee count for a nonprofit doesn't tie very well to essentially what their, their needs are. And the second was with regard to uh, what would the impact in the community be in terms of uh, uh, those, uh, th those issues. Um, specifically with regard to, so you asked, I, I believe if I remember right, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, there's about 4,000 uh, nonprofits uh, in the county. Um, and uh, frankly, of that number, the biggest specific group are houses of worship. Uh, and those would all be potentially covered in this program uh, if it was tied to just employee numbers. So again, I, I guess I'm not, is, do we have a gap yet then in the service? So if all of this is a programmatic number or any of the programs that we're asking our nonprofits to administer, uh, in turn, servicing the nonprofit community because our nonprofit community, 4,000, thanks for that number, but uh, still, that's, that is a lot of organizations that are having some impact as a consequence of COVID and the, uh, and the mitigation orders. And I'm just wondering, do we have anything in, in this sector of our allocation that's specifically there to provide some support, economic support for the losses or the costs that they're incurring in responding to COVID on an individual organization basis. In, so, I think, again, if I compare that to the for-profits, I have a five employee for-profit company, then there's lots of them and they're submitting applications to have some of their expenses covered because they're incurring losses. Nonprofits 
um, I was thinking would have this program available to them to do something comparable. And I'm, I guess I'm hearing that they may not be able to just send in an application saying it just cost me $3,000 in operating my, uh, my organization because of the COVID response. And, and I'd like to have you reimburse that. <laughs> And Commissioner, the, the the answer to be clear, the answer to your question is no. That is not um, that is not available uh, right now under any of the CARES Act programs that have been implemented. So then, the question would be, Commissioner Steck, uh, for us to consider whether or not these dollars ought to be made for operational expenses for the nonprofits. I think that's a decision that that can be made. Uh, if, the, if the allocation committee would like to go down that path, I think that's a question that we, we ought to put on the table. Well, I think you're, you're right, Wayman. I, um, it strikes me that uh, there's no question that the COVID and the, um, and the mitigation order responses uh, have had devastating effects on a lot of our businesses. But likewise, it has effect on uh, uh, on not many of our nonprofit agencies and organizations that also provide significant contributions to the strength of our communities. And um, and I guess I'm struggling with uh, whether or not we've left a gap here in what it is that we want to do to stabilize our communities. So from that standpoint, I would entertain, at least I would, Madam Chair, entertain a recommendation from staff how we would move to that. If you have directive from you, then we will take that on as well. But uh, I'm whatever the wishes of the committee, and if it's as long as it supports, it's supported by uh, the guidelines related to how COVID relief dollars from the uh, Treasury, uh, what we understand to be the uh, particular way that we can use these dollars. So I'm open to that because I, I think you make a good argument. Um, if I may jump in, we have to be quite cautious um, in a generic sense because um, we will be subject to to complaints and, and potential criticism um, if it is seen that we're spending these federal dollars to support um, actual religion. So what we can do, um, if you would like, is put together some additional uh, criteria for the chair and whomever else um, she would like to have review that, that we can make sure is in full compliance with all of our limitations and, and see if we can't find a way to thread that needle to provide the additional support, but without creating potential liabilities for the county. Yeah, no, I, I certainly understand that, Linda, and then, no question, we need to be careful as we do with, with the school funding and everything else. We need to be careful that we're not crossing those lines, but at the same time, um, it just is my experience that many nonprofit agencies don't even have the flexibilities that for-profits do um, because their funding sources are very limited, and, uh, and they, in turn, are not going to be able to expand, like going out to the market and selling more widgets. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can go through this and find that there is a uh, avenue of providing some way of supporting those agencies uh, that are, are really put uh, deep in the red because of the impacts of this. Madam Chair, if this is, you know, this is Wayman again, I, you know, I, I would be more than willing to take that on and come back with a recommendation to you and the, to the uh, subcommittee and uh, we'll, we'll put a, fast, uh, quick turnaround on that request if, you, if you'd like us to do that. Madam Chair on the line, Pam, can we lose her? Any there? I scared her off, look at that. Oh, see her. Oh, there, she's reconnecting. She's oh, reconnecting. Oh. Hopefully she heard that discussion. Please let us know when we're back on. Um, when she's back on, we can ask her what her thoughts are on it, and then we can move on to the next item. I do have a related uh, concern or suggestion um, when she comes back. This is Jim. Not yet. 
Yeah, we've been having difficulty evidently this morning. There's several of the uh, people out there that have had uh, connection problems. I don't know if that's something outside or what's going on. I know uh, the clerk had problems earlier and uh, some people were muffled a bit. So hopefully we can get that solved. She's on, but she's on mute. I'm back, sorry. Okay. okay. My, computer decided it, my computer decided it had a meeting limit today. Um, I think for the rest of that conversation, I'd love to hear from us if we only put 10 million in this fund and we, as we've mentioned, there's unlimited potential nonprofit and they all have different needs. It's not like a business where the business was shut down and their revenue stream was completely done. A nonprofit could go to donors and continue to function efforts may have slightly because of COVID. I think I think there was that distinction and and it you know how would we possibly cover and and what criteria would you use and there was no so I I think I understand why this transition provide some sort of cares related service. Um, what I do think though is missing is when we're doing that we're not. I don't think, and maybe we are, um, we need to make sure we're covering their administrative costs if they're providing a, a service. If we wanna talk about shifting this program, then we probably need to have a meeting on this um, to, or maybe staff can have a meeting or put together a proposal for the September meeting. But it, we could do it sooner if, if we can get this. Uh, uh, it is gonna be tough to establish criteria because a lot of things are nonprofits, and um, who, how do you deter? I, mean, I, I don't know. I just see see that as a pretty tough, uh, heavy lift. But um, that's the wish of the subcommittee. We can we can gain some input and, and move forward. Anyone have any comments on that? I did have Commissioner Talon's hand raised. Did he already speak? You know, I want to wait till you got back, uh, Chair, um, and and I'll just first just express my support for um, you know while you were gone, Wayman did say they could um, process a a proposal in a rather short order, and frankly, I I hope that we can talk later about meeting uh, additionally sooner uh, rather than waiting a month. But I want to add. Um, to this nonprofit piece, my concern that there are some organizations out there, and I'm hearing about more and more of them, that we have engaged to uh, provide certain services uh, for us. And as a result, because of our um, kind of prohibition against double dipping, they suddenly become not eligible for um, support of that organization. Um, that feels to me like a mistake in, in, in our intention or perhaps an um, unintended consequence. But there are potentially organizations that could have gotten more support um, through this program than they got through providing a, dis, uh, a different uh, piece of COVID relief uh, for us. I, I think um, also in particular, one that um, is near and dear to my heart is the support that we uh, have provided for paying for hotel rooms for people who are for shelter. And because of that, the organization that is managing that for us, even though they have considerable additional costs for that, um, are not eligible. That doesn't feel uh, like what we intended to me. So if we could perhaps put that into the mix and uh, consider whether we might do this a little differently in terms of the so-called double dipping than we're doing with the small business program. We, we can, Madam Chair, if you'd like us to do that, we can as well. And I would uh, uh, move to uh, suggest that we, uh, not move, but I would suggest to you that we could uh, figure a way to get us back in a room again sooner than the next meeting so that we can uh, resolve these two okay. matters. Yeah. I, I agree with Commissioner Talon. So yeah, we'll put together a plan and 
and um, kick it out. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. Nope, I'm good, thanks. Any other questions or comments on the nonprofit assistance program? I don't see any. I do think, you know, we spent a lot of time on the criteria for the small business assistance program, and I, I don't think we flushed out all these things. Um, I think staff did a great job of trying to read our tea leaves and put together something that made sense. So, you know, we, we do have a good program right now. If it looks like we need to adjust it, I think most of us are willing to do that, sounds like. So um, we will get together with, I'll get together with Wayman and, and others and, and definitely want your, uh, would really like your input. If you all could uh, email input regarding this, uh, this week beginning and next, that'd be great. Looks like Commissioner Talon has his hand raised again. Yeah, additional question on the housing piece. Um, one of the things that struck me was that we're talking about purchasing properties with these COVID relief dollars. And I just wanted to hear from staff that that's permissible. And, and what does that look like? Who's going to own those properties? Are there typically with federal dollars, there's rules for disposition and that type of thing. Could we hear a little more about that? Sure, uh, Matt, Linda, and then uh, I know that uh, Sandra Gosen Jonas has been involved with that, but uh, Steve Orte as well. So who would like to take that up? Linda, you're muted. Uh, Matt did all the legal research on uh, the ownership issues and, and whether this was eligible. So I'll let him take it. Okay. So the, uh, with regard to, um, to the, the last question first, where's the ultimate disposition of these properties? The disposition of these properties will be back with the organizations who are being funded. So we're funding them uh, and they're acquiring the properties. Um, the, the goal here, or, or they've already acquired the properties in the case of, uh, of actually all but one of these pro programs, they've already acquired the properties. And we are uh, helping, the, the goal, the, the proposals would be for the CARES Act dollars to help them um, move forward with the COVID interrupted completion of those projects to, uh, to expedite getting affordable housing stock back available in the uh, community. The one exception is a proposal we received uh, from community rebuilders, which would be uh, to for community rebuilders to acquire from uh, from link up uh, several uh, duplexes that would otherwise phase out of affordable housing, and those fund or those properties would then be um, community rebuilders affordable housing properties, and link up would then have the, the resources that are tied up with those um, current duplexes to invest in additional hou uh, affordable housing stock. So. Those are the different proposals. None of those have come through on a recommendation yet. And I have to admit, there's a little bit more uh, legal research that needs to be done with regard to this as we're vetting these proposals, as there always is as we get the proposals before we come with a recommendation. But um, I don't think that we have the concerns with regard to a disposition of federal funds uh, like we would, for example, in the HUD context uh, with regard to these ones, because there are so few statutory restrictions on the CARES Act dollars and their use by the county. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and we'll, so we'll wait to hear about the um, potential pitfalls with the community rebuilders uh, proposal. And, I, and finally, I just wanna urge that, you know, there was, um, it was said that we would have uh, final proposals for and contracts for the housing pieces in the relatively near future. And just to note that, you know, we approved this stuff three months ago and um, we're getting near the end. And if we could, you know, push to have this within a week, I hope that's relatively near as opposed to two or three weeks out. Just just a, an urging and a nudge. Uh, Commissioner Jones, did you have another question? I do. I just want to throw a bit of a future vision on an area that the county has, which is our unmet needs fund and that might take a different look depending on how COVID impacts that. So I just didn't know if Wayman had looked at that, given that thought, and I just wanted to toss that in there because that is something the county has traditionally done. This is not uh, CARES money, uh, this is county funding 
but it might tie into going into next year some of the areas that Stan Steck is uh, addressing. So I wanted to kind of throw that in there depending on what happens in, in future weeks. But either way, I do think we have that to reevaluate, consider, look at. So just wanted to put that in for some forward thinking. And we have, uh, uh, Commissioner Jones, we have looked at other funding sources as well through the Community Development uh, Office or Community Action Agency. There, there are less strings attached to those dollars. We're looking for other ways that we can supplant dollars on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so uh, uh, along with the uh, unmet needs funds that you're talking about, that's straight out of the general fund that we approve in the operating budget each year through DHS. Uh, but we are always looking for other ways to uh, predict that this will continue on and then what other funding sources are out there that we can tie to versus using the CARES dollars uh, that are limited, time limited. Okay, and I just want to say, um, I just want to recognize um, Matt's efforts and Linda's efforts and Sandra and Steve on this housing issue because I've um, weighed in a little bit on some of this and it is uh, very complex to be diplomatic. <laughs> and uh, Commissioner Talon, I'm sure you'll echo uh, those sentiments, but uh, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of different organizations. Sometimes they don't get along. Um, and so I guess I would hearken for staff to look back to our original. I think, I think actually the housing folks were one of the first people that came in and, um, and addressed the committee. And I guess we should probably either look back at those original uh, approved programming and allocations, or if we need to adjust it, we need to, to hear from them again. But um, I just want staff to understand that there is a recognition that this isn't an easy um, undertaking. So uh, please continue to plow forward as best as we can, but we understand uh, the complexity as well. So just wanted to make that comment. Uh, any other questions or comments on uh, this item number four before we move on to local units? I don't see any hands raised. Let's move on to the uh, item five local unit of government update. Yes, yes Jeff Doan is on the line and he can give us an update on the local units of government, how we're doing on that, uh, that allocation piece. Jeff? Good morning, everyone. Speaking of complex, um, <laughs> local unit of government reimbursements have gotten more complex. Since we allocated the 15 million just this morning, we learned of the amounts that the state replaced revenue sharing payments with, with CARES dollars at six and a half million dollars total for Kent County. Um, so for instance, Plainfield Township is gonna receive, just as an example, $28,355 in CARES money now in lieu of revenue sharing. And so far they've submitted just under $20,000 in expenses to Kent. So my approach now, I believe, is going to be to have them use CARES hours from the state first. Um, and then we're going to look to cover probably June's public safety costs for all of these entities. Uh, I think that's going to probably provide them the most benefit and be the easiest to track. And I've had conversations with Plant Moran saying that's an acceptable 100% use through June. They say once you get into July, it gets a little more uh, sketchy as to if 100% are actually allocated allocable to public safety costs. So I'm going to reach back out to the agencies um, with this new information, let them know to apply first to the state for their CARES portion of revenue sharing, if that makes sense. And then the last piece still outstanding is they submitted public safety payrolls for May or April and May, and they still have not heard back how much they're going to get from the state on that. So that's still in flux as well. So there's this with the state contributing money, it's, it's changed this piece of the program quite a bit since the beginning, So, but we're working to move this forward. So far, we've had 11 agencies submit actual expenses of about $4.7 million, but a lot of those did not include public safety payroll. So, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jeff, just to be clear that, okay, so the state is replacing the revenue sharing that they would have normally received for revenue sharing, in they're August. plugging it all with CARES dollars, right? Correct, yep. 
So those are just, they're just not the, covering over and above, they're not covering over and above CARES costs or COVID costs. They're basically using CARES money to cover existing function, correct? Yeah, so they just replaced the CVT, the, the, the county, village, township, revenue sharing piece, not constitutional because they couldn't touch that. So it's a smaller okay. piece. Um, and I believe that each agency has to fill out a form to either accept the CARES dollars or not. So okay. we'll instruct them to accept the CARES dollars because it looks like most of these agencies will, will not maybe even exceed the amount of the allocation from the state. I'm not sure. Okay. Again, as, as my example in Plainfield was, they're getting 28 point three or twenty eight thousand three fifty five and so far they've had just under twenty in total expenses. So but 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 our funding that we allocate or that we set aside was for you know additional CARES costs. So right. so even though the state's gonna plug that they're basically playing a shell game with their money. Right. Um over and above general operations is what we would cover, correct? Correct. So for okay. instance, if, if Plainfield ended up having, in theory, like 30,000 of total uh, COVID costs, in theory, Kent County would replace the uh, $1,700 um, over and above their allotment from the state, if that makes sense. Well, but, but no, because I, I guess I'm confused because even though they're using their CARES dollars, that's just the title of the, of the type of money coming in they were would have normally received revenue sharing money and so the state's just plugging the hole that they created by saying hey we don't have the money to give you revenue sharing so we're going to give you cares money and it's the same amount that they normally would have gotten but the state's not covering their covid related costs in terms of over and above their normal budget that they would have received regardless and that's what i'm trying to figure out is that correct it sounds correct. You confused me a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. So, 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 so if I'm Cascade Township, I have no idea what Cascade Township makes, but let's just say I'm Cascade Township and I normally get $50,000 from revenue sharing yep. and the state's like, hey, we don't have the money this year for revenue sharing. So instead of cutting your revenue sharing, we're going to fill that 50000 with our CARES money. So I had that $50,000 cost regardless of whether you know, CARES ha or COVID happened or not. What we were going to cover, to my understanding, is costs over and above their normal operating costs. So they had to implement new sanitizing stations. They had overtime. They had additional training. They, like COVID costs over and above their normal budget costs. That's what we were going to cover. And so I just, is that right? That am is I, correct. Yes. Me, okay. Yes. Okay, it's, so, it's but, just so if, it's Cascade, just... If, if Cascade normally got 50 and the, the state's going to fill that with the 50, but then they, they have 10,000 additional in COVID expenses, we would cover that 10,000. Correct. As an example. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. Sorry, sorry, that was such a long, I, I'm just trying to make it no, make it's, sense it's, in my No, it's head. very confusing <laughs> because for Cascade, I'll give you the number, they're getting $15,701 in CARES money. So, the but state. they can only accept that if they've had $15,701 of COVID related expenses. But, but they're, they're counting, their, they're counting their, their normal operating, they're allowed to count that as well, their, general, their general fund is going to be short the amount that they would have gotten paid. Right, so, right, yeah, right, right. So public safety is included in that account, right, Jeff? And that's Commissioner where Jones? I'm sorry, sorry, wait a minute. Public safety is included in that account from the state, right? Uh, well, so they had, if you submitted public safety for April and May, they're supposed to cover that out of a different pod of the 200 million. I have not seen the breakdown of how much each agency's gotten on that yet. Um, so that's another piece because they provided that $200 million bucket as well. But you can submit 100% of your public safety costs for April and May to the state. So, but, but you can submit your cost, but that would have been cost that you had regardless, correct? Like, 
for five officers, I always have five officers, I can submit that cost now because it counts, but I would have had to use, had to pay that out regardless of, of COVID. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Commissioner Jones, you had a question? Thank you, Chair. I'm going to get a little deeper down this rabbit hole for public safety. <laughs> so help me out, Jeff, in communities that are contracting with the county. Okay. So you have a community that contracts with the county is for public safety. They are paying the county for that. Correct. Who's leading that component? Well, so some of the agencies like the school resource offices have not been um, sent to the schools because schools were closed. So those, those communities were not billing specifically. So they would have no cost related to that, but they would have you know, saved that expense out of their budget. For the other agencies that are paying Kent County, that should be a public safety expense for that agency. So, I mean, is Michelle on the line or no? I don't this, believe this, so. This is something to look into, Jeff. If you're not familiar with contracted services for the townships that pay the county for additional police, I want to make sure that that public safety component, we have a handle on it, whether that responsibility is us or on the municipality, we need to have that communication really clear with our partners that work with us. Agreed. So I, I'd almost want that in writing to our partners on what they should do if it's on them or what we're doing if we're going to lead it. I'll include that in the communication I'm going to send out. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner Steck. Thank you, Chair. I guess my question on public safety uh, is we, as a committee, we allocated, and the county's allocated $15 million, uh, as the Chair said, for purposes of reimbursing our local communities, uh, uh, governmental entities, to the extent that they've incurred additional costs and expenses uh, because of COVID. Um, does that then now get interpreted such that their budgeted public safety costs would qualify under some circumstances for reimbursement under this pot? So the state has made that determination based upon some of the CARES Act guidance. Yes, that 100% of public safety costs are eligible. Well, sure. I know that the, yeah, I've heard that. I guess I'm getting back to, to the extent we have the discretion on how we want to spend this 15 million. Um, are we interpreting our commitment to spend the 15 million to include reimbursing our local organization, local governmental entities for their standard public safety costs? I'm comfortable with it through June because April, May, June, March, April, May, June, after talking with our external auditors, Plant Moran, um, who are helping us interpret the rules, they feel that 100% of public safety expenses are, are includable through June, just due to the nature of the emergency and how everything unrolled. They, they feel after June, July, August, September, it's getting a little more dicey as if to 100% is allocable. So my plan is to reimburse 100% of public safety payrolls through June, um, minus what the state reimbursed for April and May. Um, and, in, and in fact, if they don't reach their 200 million, they said they would continue to reimburse for June too. So I, I don't have that breakdown yet of how much, if they've exceeded their 200 million request or not. I think that's due out in September, um, that allocation. So there's so many moving pieces on that. Yeah, so yeah. But again, I'm I guess comfortable I doing it through June. You, I guess I wanted to get the distinction between what what the law has been interpreted to allow in reimbursement under the COVID CARES Act and what this committee has concluded we want to use the money for. And what I'm hearing is that to the extent that a local entity, um, XYZ Township, whatever it is, has uh, on its regular budget for 2020, or 2020, um, 150,000 for its uh, for its policing, public service, or public safety costs. 
Uh, some of that they would have spent regardless of COVID, but you're saying they now qualify for COVID reimbursement at 100% of those costs up to June, but they're not really additional costs that are necessarily incurred. They're just costs that are now qualified for reimbursement. And so I guess I'm getting to, is that still meet the spirit of what we wanted to do with these funds by way of going back and while we can legally cover it now because of the definitions, these are not really additional funds, um, additional costs and expense. So, and if that is what we are now going to use these funds for, how much of this 15 million is ultimately would, would be used to reimburse for public safety, 100% of public safety costs? I guess that's a question in my mind for the committee. Um, for instance, my guess is June public safety payroll in Kent County would be roughly $9 million. Um, I did get some num numbers from Grand Rapids that are about 5.8 and Wyoming is 1.4-ish. So, so, if we, I, so I Jeff, estimate if we about got, nine. So if we, if we determine to allocate this money for purposes of reimbursing local uh, entities for their public safety costs at 100%, uh, we could use all 15 million of this today. I'm not sure if we only did it through June, if we'd use the full 15. I, I'm estimating yeah. about nine. Well, I think it poses the question for the committee whether or not that's consistent with what we wanted to accomplish. Well, but, but I'm confused if the state's going to cover those costs, why would we cover those costs? They're covering them for April and May. Okay. And we were anticipating covering June's. Oh, okay. But again, we don't have the resolution how much was applied for towards the 200 million state allocation. Um, I know Grand Rapids submitted, I think, approximately $11 million to the state on that phase, but they have not heard back yet as to if that 11 million was fully covered or not. We don't know how much was. Um, Do we know when the state's going to make that determination? I think it's September 18th. I'd have to double check the date, but somewhere in that time range. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Skaggs, you had your hand up, but I, I will call on you and then I would like to hear from Commissioner Breeby and Jones, uh, you know, your input on this, what your thoughts. You trailed off there, man. I'll just go ahead and start. Um, Commissioner Skaggs. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, after hearing that discussion um, between uh, Chair Bolter uh, and Jeff, I'm, I'm even more confused. Um, so obviously, right, a, 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 as Mandy mentioned, this is, a, uh, this is just a budget shell game, um, right, to use federal funds to, to plug holes in the state budget. And so we're really just renaming this money uh, from calling it revenue sharing to calling it CARES which, you know, fine, creative accounting. Um, but as Mandy mentions, it's not extra money. Um, and so if, you know, are you, I guess the question that I have, which maybe you've already answered and I just didn't hear it, but are, are we being hamstrung by how much we can give them now because it has the title cares to it? Or are we just pretending that this is actually still what it is which is revenue sharing funds. Um, and therefore we're going to continue to fund uh, COVID related expenses. So if I understand your question correctly, the, the guidance said for ease of convenience, 100% of public safety payroll can be deemed COVID eligible, therefore eligible under the CARES Act. Hence the state filled a budget hole by allowing a lot of their public safety expense to be reimbursed with CARES dollars. So in lieu of charging the general fund for their public safety costs, they're charging the CARES fund. That makes sense. So we're, our determination, if we continue down this route, is to say the same thing through June after discussion with our auditors. They're comfortable with that, that that meets the CARES guidelines. I wouldn't say we're reimbursing revenue sharing, no, because it is a valid COVID expense according to the guidelines. Additionally, there's, you know, they've submitted about $4.7 million total, the, the 11 governments, and most of that has nothing to do with public safety. Some of it is, Wyoming asked for some, 
But most of that is the PPE, the building modifications, all the other things that are eligible for care specific actions, if that makes sense. So it, it is kind of a shell game. It's interesting, I was on a call um, countrywide on Monday with all the agencies that re received a direct allocation and there's different interpretations across the country. For instance, many of them are saying 100% of payroll, yep, we're applying it. So I've, I know one community that applied 70 million out of 170 million to public safe, of their own public safety costs to the CARES fund. Others are more conservative saying, we don't feel like that meets the, the, the guidance of the CARES Act. So we're kind of in that bubble um, where our auditors, again, have said they're comfortable through June, 100%, if that's the route we wanna go, is eligible, plus the additional directly related CARES um, I'm sorry, you know, COVID related costs. Okay, good. All right. That end made sense. Um, okay. Second question. Um, I don't know. When I was looking at this on my phone yesterday, I, there was a breakdown by city, um, but I don't see it in the packet right now. Um, I know that uh, I think Grand Rapids got somewhere in the vicinity of around 400, 450,000. Uh, Wyoming was significantly more. Um, how much of the money that was put in by you know our major jurors, our, our major cities? Um, so to be clear, we haven't paid. Was accepted and reimbursed. We haven't paid any reimbursement yet to the locals because all of this information has been pending. So we received these. None of these have been approved or paid. So so far, Grand Rapids has submitted. 877, 878,000. Wyoming was 2.6. But again, Wyoming submitted payroll, public safety payroll. Grand Rapids did not while all this is pending. So before we pay anything, we need to be clear with the locals what all is included and what isn't. And if we're covering June public safety, allow them all to submit that before we determine the final allocations. Okay. Um... But the, the total is 11 agencies and two townships have submitted the rest have been cities. Okay, great, that's all I have. But again, Jeff, they're asking to, they're, the guidance is saying, you can now submit your 100% your public safety costs as CARES. We weren't planning to, to pay for payroll for public safety, for, for standard public safety costs at the beginning of this. We were planning on paying for the additional costs that they had that the state wouldn't cover. So the reason that you haven't paid it out yet, in my understanding, is because the state keeps changing what they're gonna cover and what they're not gonna cover. Correct. So they're saying we're gonna cover all of April and all of May's uh, public safety costs. Here you go. So we don't know what's happening for June, but even if we don't know what's happening for June, we haven't made the determination as a committee whether we would cover normal public cares cost, COVID costs. So, so I guess the 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 miscommunication is the feds determined that you could that is an allowable expense your public safety costs. But it doesn't mean that that's what we've decided to cover as a subcommittee. Does that make sense? I Jeff, think so. Am I you, right? You broke up a lot through that, but I believe, yes. <laughs> I believe I heard most of it. But we did internally do that for the sheriff department. I'm okay. sorry, say that again, um, Commissioner. I mean, didn't we, know, didn't did we, we do that internally for the sheriff department? Maybe not 100%, but that was a $12 million allocation. Yeah, but they were specifically related to COVID-related expenses. That's how Yeah, but a lot of that was payroll. Yeah. Right, but, but it was payroll, payroll specifically allocated to COVID work. So they were, they were taking, like the school resource officers were reassigned. So that was 100% COVID. And there was percentages of other staff. It was not 100% of payroll in those estimates. Because if we did, I mean, that's me, a we, suspect, but okay. I mean, if we did 100%, an officer that they paid to put it in a school, now they're paying to, to retrain it and put them on a road, even though they came just from the road into the school. Um, you know, we decided to do that because we decided to do that. But 
you know, we were very flexible internally. It would not be nice to see that kind of flexibility externally with our partners. Right, and I would just, I would just echo, can you guys hear me okay? Can, can you guys hear me? I would just echo that this is, this funding was for county expenses. We chose to provide, can you guys hear me? Yes. We chose to provide that a, in, in a collaborative effort, but if the state's going to cover those costs, which they're supposed to cover first, we would want the state to cover those costs first. Yeah. Everyone's frozen on my screen except me and Wayman. <laughs> yeah, I agree. They're just listening to you. They are just. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're all like. <laughs> So, so Zoom crashed yesterday um, and told Mr. us Talon? it could be Zoom. Commissioner Talon? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I, I, I want to make sure that we are finding ways to support our local units. I'm surprised at the um, low level of, of uh, applications that have been submitted so far for reimbursement. Um, but I also, I think what we're not talking about here is that one of the issues that we have is that we had a certain understanding of what these dollars for local units would be used for when we set the $15 million limit uh, for the, the bucket. And when the uh, when the eligibility for reimbursement changed, in my mind, that really limits what we can do with that 15 million because, um, you know, units like the city of Grand Rapids are gonna have a ton of additional COVID related public safety uh, expenses, costs that, that we need to take a look at. That 15 million will be gone you know, as soon as we find out from the state, that's gonna be gone right away. And it feels like we're way underfunded in supporting our local units for what are legitimately, and, and they would say legitimate COVID related costs. So I, yeah, this, this, this is really difficult, but it feels like we're severely underfunded in this bucket. Madam Chair, can I speak to that? For me, I would be concerned about co covering 100% of public safety general costs. That, even though that's an allowable expense, that's great, but I would be concerned. Am I coming through okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, however, you know, I would ask, it looks like Steck and then Joe says their hand up. I would ask out today, it sounds like we need to get the attorneys on this um, to make some clarifications. So I would ask for that. And Commissioner Steck, would you like to comment? Yeah, so again, going back to what I think that we all agreed on when we started the uh, allocations here is that we would be looking to our local units of governments to identify what were the additional costs and expenses that they are incurring uh, in responding to COVID. And uh, what we then did is set this 50 million as that number. We subsequently learned, as I understand it, that it has been confirmed that 100% of public safety costs could qualify under the CARES Act. So what the state did is use its funds to reimburse local entities 100% up through May, I guess, is what Jeff said. So the question for us as a committee is, do we want to also use that application? We don't have to use that interpretation. We may, but do we also want to reimburse our local entities 100% of their public safety costs for June? And then the question is, do we go beyond? And what I'm suggesting is that that is a material difference from what we had initially intended when we set aside these funds. Yes, it is apparently legally allowed under CARES, um, but 
that's not the spirit of what we intended. We intended to go to the local communities and say, okay, what's been your additional costs? Not are we going to backfill and cover your budgetary costs for public safety, even if we are entitled to do it. So I, you know, Commissioner Talent, I, I don't agree that we are treating our local entities unfairly if we don't do that. Um, because these are expenses that are not incurred because of COVID. They're reimbursable because of the definition uh, of the statute, but I don't see it as uh, being additional costs. And likewise, uh, I guess what I'm hearing from Wayman is we didn't go back to the Sheriff's Department, even if that's 100% coverable. We didn't go back to the Sheriff's Department and say, all right, what was your total public safety cost for, uh, for all of these months? And we're going to reimburse you 100%. Uh, if so, we wouldn't even have 100 million left <laughs> to play with at all. It'd be gone. So it seems to me what we did do is internally we asked the, the sheriff to identify what were the additional costs. Let's, let's find what your additional expenses in responding to COVID. And it's that uh, additional expense that we are applying uh, these funds for. So I don't think we're treating the local entities any differently than we're treating ourselves internally by saying, uh, no, we're not going to do 100% uh, reimbursement for your public safety costs for July or June. Um, but we will look at what are your additional expenses. Now, uh, you know, I think that's where we are. I think that we've made the commitment to spend for the additional costs. It would take an additional decision by this group to say we will reimburse 100% now that COVID rules are being interpreted to allow that. That's all I got to say about that. <clears throat> All right, Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair Bolter. I think on this topic, there are more questions than we're ready for answers. And I was curious, picking up on Jim Talon's suggestion, is this one of the topics we can add to future meetings? Maybe we do need to look at, in order to keep this moving in the right direction, we need to have more frequent meetings because there's there are a lot of dynamics. This is very fluid. Um, I certainly would like to to if we can vet this out after a little bit more time versus trying to do this in the next couple hours without all the information when this just came to light right now. So can we put this on a topic that we hit? and set a meeting as soon as possible to address this and a number of other things that have come up in our discussion. I'm open to that. Mr. Skaggs. Um, I guess, thank you, Chair. I guess if we're, if we're open to that, I think that makes sense. But I think if we're going to have that discussion, we should probably reopen um, the decisions that we made with the sheriff to make sure exactly where we are so that we're comparing things clearly there. Um, because we were certainly generous and flexible with ourselves and internally in the county, right? We gave ourselves, what, $38 million? Um, and yet we're talking about, uh, you know, an entirely, um, and we did that. We did that because we wanted to get that money out quickly. Uh, which is something that this that this subcommittee has been very interested in and in some ways we've been very successful at that um, in some ways we've been slower than than I would have rather hoped um, in this case we've given no money whatsoever to uh, any of our municipalities not just cities but townships is my understanding zero dollars have gone to help um, and you know although it's August in Michigan and uh, I'm skeptical about what day it actually is I can look it up and find out it's August 27th. Um, and if my understanding is correct, uh, we started uh, we started this pandemic back around uh, March. Um, and we just need to think very clearly um, about what our mandate is. Maybe we need to go back and look at that too, because I thought our mandate was to distribute money uh, throughout the county to deal with the COVID response. Um, and I just think the flexibility that we gave ourselves uh, is the same sort of flexibility that we ought to give uh, our partners and it's the same sort of flexibility that I think we've given the business community. 
Madam Chair, someone mentioned about meeting next week after finance committee meeting. Uh, that's a potential to go through this plus the other two items that were mentioned. Uh, Hello? Mandy, you're breaking up. Um, can we meet after the board meeting on September 10th? I don't think this is something that we'll be able to pull together in it is next day, correct? September the 10th. Yes, we could do that as well. Finance is next, correct? So that's, it doesn't. Let me not give it a snub time. Correct. September I would 10th. like to do September 10th after the board meeting for this topic and anything else. And then there's an LHR meeting as well. Right. Or after the LHR meeting. I'd say one of those two would be ideal. So Madam Chair, it's your call. I, I, I'm sorry. My, I got for a couple of so so madam chair lhr meeting september the 8th board meeting september the 10th those are the two closest meetings that we could actually host a redo of this discussion and answer uh, hopefully a lot of the questions that have been raised for more information on the table for you can mandy give us her uh, thought on chat because i'm not hearing anything from her Pam's texting her. Can we text her, Pam? Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on with my computer. Can anyone hear me? No, we can't. Yes, yeah. way better. Um, I think we definitely need a meeting. I don't think next Tuesday is gives us enough time. I heard Commissioner Jones mention the tent. Does that give everyone that's what in two weeks? Does that give everyone enough time? Mandy or the eighth? It's uh, after LHR. So those were the two that kind of came up while you were uh, breaking up. I guess I would ask staff and legal counsel: Can we get all of this flushed out? by then do we think i think it's doable september the 8th mandy I, I really i think we could now that is the day after labor day correct so do we are we all around and i did see on the zoom that commissioner morgan had his hand raised right before i got kicked off so <laughs> roger i don't know if you had additional comments yeah i'm gonna need Uh, some of these parameters have changed and so uh, I'm not sure I'm in favor of just wholesale going in and uh, funding anything so um, I, I'm gonna want to uh, investigate what we've done and I thought that was a separate program but um, yeah I, I need to do some research and uh, maybe I'll be ready by the 8th maybe I won't but uh, the 10th sure looks better to me I agree and I would say too that I'm not comfortable, this is just my two cents and I would like to hear from everyone else, I'm not comfortable covering standard public safety costs. That's not what we did with the county, that's not what I think we should do in general um, because we may have allocated buckets that once we get that analysis, which we haven't even gotten to on today's agenda, um, once we get that, we may see where we need to apply funds in other areas. This was county CARES money, and it was applied by the county and it came in for the county. We made the decision to share that with our uh, partners in other municipalities before we knew that the state was going to do that and before we knew what was covered and what was allowable. So I wanna give the staff some grace that it's not that they've, <laughs> been trying to be difficult the state has moved the ball the feds have changed criteria 
things have changed since May. So, but I, I wouldn't be comfortable covering standard public safety costs. I would be more comfortable covering costs over and above that were COVID related expenses. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, would love to hear from others. I'm not gonna be able to see you on this Zoom. So Wayman, I'll have you administer this at this point. Yeah. The meeting. Sure. I'm now looking out here. Uh, any other comments? I don't see any other hands. Any other comments on this particular item? I have my hand up. Um, I this is Commissioner Brevy. You know, I think we set out to cover COVID-related expenses, not you know general expenses for our municipalities. And you know, like Commissioner Bolter said, um, you know, we're funding them. I don't think we, you know, are required to. Um, I think we have to fill the buckets that we've already agreed to. And, you know, perhaps if there are funds, if there are funds available, we can look at this further down the road. But, you know, like Roger Morgan too, I need some more information on this. And, you know, I look forward to meeting on the 10th and further discussing this. I'm sure it sounds like you have consensus to do the September the 10th meeting. Okay, that sounds good to me if we're all around and we have a lot of work to do and it probably will be a long meeting. Uh, can we agree to move on from <laughs> item five? Cause we have six, seven, eight, nine yet. Shh. No hands. I think everybody's interested in moving on. <laughs> okay, let's move on to item six, the Wi-Fi uh, issue. Mary Beth, can you yep. give a quick high-level update on this and we can share more later, but could you give us a high level? I will. I'm uh, going to go ahead and share my screen and Chair Bolter, I just emailed you this chart as well. Uh, but we have had an overwhelming response from the townships on their interest in getting a Wi-Fi access point. We have 10 that have replied affirmatively and we are moving forward with them. I have four that have replied as maybe. I have four that have declined because they already have that service. And there are only three that are outstanding that I have not gotten any response from. I have been emailing and uh, calling. So I just have three that, that I have yet to, to hear from. Okay. So with that, we are pursuing also the parks uh, in terms of locations, which we put the hotspots as well. We're also identifying opportunities to work with the Kent, ISD, Kent uh, District Library. So uh, you might be aware that the, the Kent District Library made a presentation to the board uh, a couple weeks back, their annual update, which they talked about the potential to partner with us and we followed up with them as well. So Mary Beth, you wanna continue? Yeah, so with the Kent District Library, they sent over a request for us to fund 1,375 devices, which would come to a total of 2,000, I'm sorry, $280,000. And then with also within that same 1 million that we've allocated for hotspots, it looks like depending on how the townships reply, we will for sure be able to fund at least 20 parks with uh, Wi-Fi hotspots as well, so that we can really spread this out throughout the county. And uh, the amount um, that was, go ahead. Uh, I remember us discussing this. Um, I do have some concerns that these dev this 1,300 devices is, is this amount of money. Um, no one's discussed this with me since that point, so I mean, I have concerns that, you know, have we went back and last I knew we were going to discuss seeing if we could get those devices at a better rate or get more of them for a, a lower cost. Um, right. This is not, <laughs> there, feels like a little bit of a surprise on the, um, you know, based on what we discussed last time. So Chair Bolter, we have not um, formally agreed to anything with Kent District Library. Uh, legal is preparing a memo for you that gives a breakdown of all of what I just covered. And so the only work that 
the, the only people that I have reached out to affirmatively has been the township organizations to get that primarily lifted off the ground until we have approval from you and Administrator Britt on the remainder of the items. Do we have any other locations secured besides townships? We had talked about parks, but you know, we did have a lot of discussion about the need to, you know, put these in areas where there's um, concern for, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the poverty rate or people who can't afford internet. Where are we at with that? We do, we've held off on the neighborhood associations at this point because they do fall within that nonprofit realm. And I wanted, we wanted to make sure we are first addressing the township need. Uh, and then we, we can discuss further. It just got a little dicey when we started talking about how do we equitably uh, offer this to neighborhood associations when they fall within that not-for-profit realm. And do we need to make the same offer to all nonprofits? And that was advice that I had gotten from legal early on when we started talking about neighborhood associations. And what about Grand Rapids Public right. Libraries? And I'm back. And can you hear me? Can you guys yeah. hear me now or no? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, we can't. It looks like Commissioner Taylor. You're still breaking up. Can we pretend she called on me? <laughs> I think I heard her say tell. <laughs> I, I thought it was more of a... Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Not a tough. <laughs> I think she disappeared so waving you may have to chair here. I thought I heard Talon, but I'm sorry, Commissioner Skaggs. I'm Talon sorry, I'll go second. I'll go after Jim. No, I just uh, wanted to verbalize my written comment. What about Grand Rapids Public Libraries? There's certainly a, a big void there if we're just doing KDL. Were they all the way were they or were they not on the list? Oh, Wayman? Sure. Uh, the, the proposal that was received from KDL indicates that they partner with all the other libraries. Yeah, that's what I thought too. So it probably includes Grand Rapids. Can we verify yeah. that? You can, yes. Thanks, thank you. Correct, and KDL has also um, offered in their proposal that they will lend out to any resident of Kent County, whether they are in or outside of that city district. Madam Chair, back on it now again. I'm on by phone. I can't get on by my computer. So, Wayman, you'll just have to put, call on people with hands up because I can't sure. see it. Commissioner Skaggs. Thank you. O okay, so um, I I'm going to try to hold back on my frustration here. Um, having the Kent, Di Kent District Library say that they will pass out these little Wi-Fi devices to people from the city doesn't really help us if they don't if they have trouble getting to the the Ada KDL branch. Um, a thousand of these devices seems uh, like just throwing a drop of water in Lake Michigan as far as the impacts that it would have on the access to have um, I mean, if we're doing this for the, for the kids, at least in part, if we're doing it for people who have to work, for people who have to go to school, um, sending this out to just the townships, because legal decided that, uh, that for, for reasons that are unknown to me, um, that if this was supposed to be for broadband and Wi-Fi throughout the county, then it needs to be throughout the county, and throughout the county means it needs to be in Grand Rapids. Um, so I hear parks, but I don't know, is that just county parks? Because we don't have any in Grand Rapids. Um, and I hear libraries, but maybe they have something, but we don't know. Um, again, it's August 27th. Um, when did we approve this? Um, this just seems really bad. We have a really good, great system. Um, 
Let's dump this whole idea of working with the KDL on little teeny things that we rent out to one family. That's a thousand kids. That's not enough. Let's create these serious Wi-Fi spots throughout the county, not just out in the townships again, but throughout the county, in the cities, um, and bring Wi-Fi to everyone uh, that needs it. My understanding with what's we, what we're going to be looking at for these uh, Wi-Fi's is that they can take 50 plus people on them. So for every dollar that we put into those, that's 50 people versus these little KDL programs, that's one person, maybe two or three if there's multiple kids in the family. I don't know how this has been thought through, but to come back this late and tell us that I've reached out to the township offices, you know, it's getting pretty near unacceptable. Um, so please get this program in gear, reach out. Don't tell these people, we're spending so much time here thinking about, do we send money for this? Do we send money for that? Do we go through here? What program is this in? Let's just get the funds out there and find a way to help people. The schools are open. Um, so please, please get this program up and running, not for these hundred devices, a thousand devices. Let's get our hotspots up. Let's get them throughout the county. Let's decide that we can send them to places and not have them go through some other program. This is a program that's dealing with this issue. Make it available to everyone. Um, that's, that's all I have, but um, I read this and I'm deeply frustrated to represent cities and to hear that only townships have been contacted on this. Deeply frustrated. Do we have any other hands up? Commissioner Jones has a hand up. Well, I'll let Wayman address that first before I go ahead and talk. Well, you know, I guess I would rather we take the time right now to, to, to hear your question, to respond to that. I will simply say this. If you want us to push out the hotspots and not KDL, the staff will do whatever the committee wants. We're not here to push the Wi-Fi project via KDL. If it's the committee's re recommendation that we move in a different direction, I, I've, I've shared with Commissioner Bolter that my hope was that we would move as quickly as we could to provide support for the schools and others who were not able to access Wi-Fi as they were rapidly moving towards uh, beginning school. And so that idea was something that we capitalize on based on the results that the KDL had back early on when COVID first hit, where they were able to provide these supports through Wi-Fi and we heard their report. So we don't have to go down that road. It just simply was a quicker way to mobilize the support for the schools and any other entity that was out there, uh, uh, businesses as well, who could benefit from having that service provided. But it's, it's you know, we're, we're willing to do whatever uh, the subcommittee and the board wants. At this point, I'm really not tied to either one. Uh, it was simply a way to get at what we understood to be a uh, response to a need that was rapidly growing with the start of school. And, and the schools themselves have, have actually provided these Wi-Fi uh, devices uh, to their local uh, students in Grand Rapids Public Schools in particular, provided several of these to their students. So it's not something that's foreign in terms of how you go about providing a support and a service to the, to the community. It's simply how, how, will you, how would you want us to, to um, in addition to what the KDL, in addition to what the KNISD and the and school districts are doing, is this the way that you want to see uh, these dollars uh, be used. So I'm, I'm open to whatever uh, the subcommittee would want us to do. And, and I can add clarification. So all of those that are in that affirmative row have received agreements from the county and can start and have started pursuing doing the site survey so that they can get these up and running. So that's not just an affirmative that is they're saying yes, but we've already started the motion on getting the site survey so that these devices can be up and running.
Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair Bolter. So our CARES funding is limited to the end of December. What happens in the Wi-Fi world? Do all these devices get cut off? Are we paid for going forward? What, what happens at that point? The so I can answer that a little bit. Um, the, from my understanding, depending on what service provider we use, um, we can purchase the devices, the, the, the massive Wi-Fi device with CARES money. That has been our equipment. And, and I'll go through this and Mary Beth can correct me where I'm wrong. That has been our equipment. We then have to pay the vendor, a, a, an installer to install it. If it's installed at a public, a government entity, we, we can pay out of CARES money the monthly service, the, the monthly Wi-Fi service, which is roughly 40 to $50 a month. And then when the CARES money runs out in December, if it is on, if it is, if it is on a government uh, funded entity, we could transfer that contract over to that entity and then they could just continue to pay the monthly fee if they chose to do so. We would still then have all these units. So if, if, if uh, you know, Bound Township decided it wasn't really working and they didn't want it anymore, we could potentially still have a unit and move it somewhere. Maybe we decide in our budget that we want to continue out of our general fund to pay for these to, to continue to cover Wi-Fi throughout the county. I, I don't know what we do with them, but we do have that option. That's why it was kind of nice to get these up and government um, controlled entities like schools and, and, and community parks and stuff because we can transfer that contract over depending on what service provider we use. Mary Beth, did I get that correct? Yeah, that was absolutely correct. And I wanted to add there are some townships that have expressed interest in multiple devices because they do want to spread it out. Um, if they already have a Wi-Fi uh, hotspot at their township building, they're looking to put it in a, a local park that has an adjacent parking lot. So they are thinking, you know, broader than just their township building as they're provisioning these and putting in their requests. Okay, so follow-up question. How many of these have we secured? We have funding right now for 120 devices but we haven't bought any yet no as we get the affirmation from the township that's when the the purchase starts happening and the townships have to go through a formal process to approve the purchase uh in some cases right. they, have to, they have to get their board's approval or their uh township council's approval Commissioner Jones, did that answer your question? And then do you have any others? And then Wayman, are there any other hands up on this? So just also um, with, with Commissioner Skaggs to make this a priority would be ideal because the, the time does continue to tick away and having this moving sooner versus later would be ideal. Commissioner Steck has his hand up, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Scott. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So I don't really know the technical answer as to what's the uh, best technology to maximize outreach to uh, as many of our uh, students across the county, including Grand Rapids. Um, but 120 strikes me as being a, a small number. Um, and I'm not sure why we would be limited to that. And frankly, if if in order to get this equitably allocated across the county uh, and in place immediately, um, we need to allocate more money, I think we ought to take a look at that. But, um, but absolutely, I just I, I, I share a little bit of the frustration that we need to get this thing moving. We need to have these things up. If we have to supplement it, great, but we need to start getting these, these sites in place, getting the Wi-Fi available, because there are students out there right now that need it. Did we have any other comments on that? I had a comment. I just, I just wanted to echo that and, and make sure that, you know, I, I hope I've made myself clear here. Um, 
There are parks in East Grand Rapids. I'd love to put some of these up in a park in East Grand Rapids. There are parks in Grand Rapids. I'd love to put these up in parks in Grand Rapids. I don't know why the townships were given um, first billing on this, and I hope that doesn't put them first in line um, so that the townships gobble up all of these hotspots. And then by the time we get around to deciding that maybe we'll go and ask the cities, although I hear uh, that there's been some communication or miscommunication with the cities, um, that we're now out of them. Um, so somehow this program needs to be um, improved and improved quickly. And I think if this means going to an outside contractor, we should go to an outside contractor. Um, because if the discussion that I'm hearing from staff is that they wanted to get this up before schools got into session, you missed the deadline. Um, and I don't know if we have a contract with AT&T uh, we haven't put anything up, and I know my kid back, went back to school on Monday. Um, so I want to express the deep, frust deep frustrations of myself and my constituents on this. Um, get your act together and get this done right and get this done equitably throughout the county and not just out in the townships and get it done quickly. Any other comments on this item? Yeah, this is Commissioner Steck. I'd raise one more question. Um, is it possible to prepay some of these contracts? I know that we have to spend the money before the end of the year, but um, if we're going to Verizon, whoever is our provider on this, can you prepay to extend this through the end of the full calendar year or school year? Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can only pay for these through the end of the calendar year? Correct. There are regulations under the CARES money that we can't, if you will, stockpile, so we can't uh, fill a warehouse full of materials and we can't prepay a contract that normally is paid by the month. We can pay 100% of public safety that we can't stockpile. Okay. I'm looking for rationality, right. sorry. Let's keep moving this along. Um, any other comments, questions on item six? Any hands raised? No hands raised. All right, it is 12.20. We've been at this various meeting since 7.30 this morning. So I would like to get through the next three items quickly. Um, I cannot see the CARES allocation plan, so I don't know if someone can email that to me or if you have. Um, and then we are, it sounds like we are gonna plan on meeting September 10th. Um, so with that, uh, who wants to discuss item seven? Steve Duarte is on the line. Steve, you want to take us to this uh, CARES allocation uh, plan and where we are at? Uh, I will. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. It's been a long morning. I'll try to get through this very quickly. At the last subcommittee meeting, there was a expressed desire to come up with a buckets report that showed where we were at within each individual bucket. This report is an attempt to do that for you. I would point out, like all financial statements, it's a point in time. And you'll notice this one is through uh, the left-hand corner through August 21st, 2020. And the format going from left to right is that we've listed the bucket, that we have incurred the expense, encumbered, total encumbered and expense. The budget that we started with and what is a rough estimate where we're at with what remains within it. Uh, going down the left side real quick, the first five are health department uh, type expenditures. Uh, then the return to work PPE was for uh, county facilities that need to be prepared for the returning workforce the sheriff and corrections are the next two. Implementation covered uh, outside audit firms and outside legal work. Uh, economic stabilization, I will point out on page two is broken out. So that you see some of the individual commitments. All these activities are obviously focused on uh, maintaining the economy or economic uh, recovery. Uh, and then the various was the unallocated at that point and most and all of that has been allocated at this point and the county expenses total were just over 11.8 we got about 10.4 committed so of that total we got 
2.3 million going with about 12 million uh, remaining. Any questions on that category? And the business assistance, uh, as I will tell you again, and I've told you before when I do financial reports, this stuff is changing daily almost. But uh, again, uh, business assistance, we have the business grants, chamber technical assistance. Again, on page two, there's a breakout of where that uh, money was allocated and committed to. And business PPE, which you've received a number of reports. But just for instance, on the, on the uh, business grants, we show $7.3 million expended. Okay, as of uh, Monday, we sent out some more checks and stuff. That number has jumped to 8.5. I just wanna show you how quickly those things are changing. Uh, mitigation of homelessness. Uh, we've had some discussion today. Uh, on the rent eviction program of uh, a contract outstanding or uh, being considered by Salvation Army, million dollars, family promises spent uh, their half million, 300,000 has uh, already been reimbursed. I'm told they're submitting their reimbursement for the last 200,000 today. Any question on either of those categories? Okay. Uh, oh, sure. Talon has a question. Yep. Yep, on, the, go ahead, Talon. on the hotel motel piece, um, it's my understanding that the, um, you know, a part of the formula that was given to us early on was that there would be um, uh, FEMA dollars supporting some of the costs and that uh, based on that assumption, 500,000 is what is needed. It's my understanding that the FEMA still has not come through. Um, do we have an update on the status of that or um, can we look at some other alternative if those FEMA dollars can be used next year, if they come through later, um, do we have some alternatives to continue to support this? It's my understanding that we're, um, we're again in some financial straits here because of the FEMA. And the latest update that I received was that we're planning to make a reimbursement request to FEMA that they require some MOUs to be in place, that those are drafted and being sent out to, to the various players in the field, and we would hope to have something going, I would hope within the next week to 10 days to see some money coming in from them. When that happens, we will make whatever adjustments we need from the accounting perspective to try and accommodate that money in and make that $500,000 go further. Could we put that in the agenda for the, the next meeting in a couple of weeks just to get an update on that, where it's at? Just a second, I'm waiting for closed caption to catch up. I guess that's a question for yeah. Wayman and the sure. chair. As far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions before Steve continues? No. No other hands raised. No other hands. No other hands. Okay. Um, let's say. Uh, Vulnerable populations, uh, we have uh, child care needs. We again discussed earlier, first steps, buddy by five, uh, receiving a contract for 450,000. Uh, we continue to look at other options and, and requests. We'll have something for you later uh, for that. Uh, Not-for-profits is being led by uh, uh, United Way. Uh, again, this is uh, one of those situations where we show 453,000 as of uh, uh, the 21st. But again, we'll have released some more checks this month that, uh, or this week, excuse me. And we're a little over a million plus now in, in disbursements there. Uh, we have a direct contract with the NAACP being considered for $100,000. Technology, we've talked uh, a lot about. There's not much going on in terms of expenses uh, for this report, 
there's a lot of going on outside that. Uh, Ada Township represents the 6,000 that we show us encumbered as they have received the contract. Uh, not much more on expenditures for the rest of the categories. Uh, we still have a reserve of slightly over $18 million. Again, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Any questions for Steve? Any hands up? No hands raised. All right, let's proceed. Anyone have any questions? Are we, are we through that? Steve, you can continue did, on. Are you finished? Did we skip vulnerable populations? Okay. Um, closed caption is apparently terminated due to the length uh, of the meeting, so. Correct, that's correct, Steve. I am at a disadvantage now. So with regards to your question about uh, vulnerable populations, Commissioner, in particular, do you want uh, further clarification on that? Uh, yes, well, I, uh, the, I, it jumped out at me, the mental health line item, which has no expenditures, and I didn't see in the notes what was intended there or what work was going on was with related, that. Yes, this was related to the uh, Network 180 in anticipation that there would be needs there, but they have not yet come to us with any additional uh, uh, needs. Uh, as you know, they are more flushed down than they were and uh, are responding well. So those dollars are going to be, I suspect, on the table for further use for another use. And you say they haven't come to us, but have we gone to them? Do they, yes, are we they, have. they're clearly aware that those dollars were allocated. Yes. Okay, We've done thank you. a couple, two or three times. Yes. Great, we're aware. Great. We're, we're aware. Thank you. And uh, Steve, you've, you've gone through most of the uh, presentation here. I, what I would suggest, Madam Chair, is you think about the total that we've spent today and what's available, the total dollars that are still left to be spent. And, and, and we're showing $72 million uh, that we've actually, uh, to date, if you go back to the top, top, of the, top of the column, top, top line, go all the way up, bam. That's remaining, 72 million that's remaining of the 114.6. So the discussion that you all were having and last time we talked was whether or not we should take the time to determine where to make these other shifts as we near the end of the second uh, reporting period. We've gone through uh, two reporting cycles. Uh, cycle one was 3-1 to 6-30. We're now into the second uh, reporting cycle, which is uh, our next report from 7-1, 9-13 uh, is due, uh, I'm sorry, 9-3 is due 10-13. So with that, we wanna make sure that we are uh, also communicating back with the feds about what we're doing, I would recommend we, we take the time at the next meeting to go through uh, this and determine uh, what your wishes might be in terms of moving dollars elsewhere. We can make recommendations for you, uh, but uh, based on the conversation related to public safety today, uh, I think that's uh, 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 going to be an indicator for us in terms of what we need to do, as well as for the local governments. Uh, the conversation we had about the local governments. So, so, uh, so my, so this is Mandy. My concern is that if we still have 72 million that we haven't kicked out, it is hard for us as a subcommittee, even going back two weeks from now, to tell if that's if that's really what's left over that we need to reallocate, or if that's money that is 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 truly spoken for and not just allocated. We, we had talked about, you know, and you, you gave us, this is what, what's, been, what's been cut, actually sent out into the community to date, but, but, but it is hard for us to make that determination, and it sounds like we need to make that determination at our next meeting. If we don't know what's truly going to go out the door spoken for versus what we've allocated, does that make sense? That's, that's correct. Yeah, that's exactly right because we still have the dilemma related to uh, the CARES funding, the revenue sharing dollars uh, that the state's providing via CARES and that conversation regarding public safety. 
because that could take. Yeah, but that's only but that's only 15. We've only allocated 15 million of the 115 million for that. So that that I mean that is a question mark. But we, but 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 we still have you know a lot that we still need to know what is actually going to go out the door versus what do we need to reallocate. So if we could, if staff could help us, if you guys could help us get a clearer picture of that for the tent. We can give um, you estimates. Would, we could give you estimates. Um, that would be really uh, as helpful. Best we could, yes. Okay. Um, I, I would like to move along if we could. My my son has an eye doctor appointment in 20 minutes. Um, uh, do we have? Do we need to have any other questions on this allocation document? Mandy, I've got one. It's uh, Diane Jones, and I just wanted to say that we also need to have our deadlines for that second wave allocation that we had set aside. I'd like to know the timeline on that as into when we expected to discuss that, allocate that. Remember there was 20 million set aside for the second wave. Yes. That's a great point. Um, yeah, what do we want to, where is that going? So, um, and we can make those recommendations to you based on what okay. you say. Yes. That would be good. Any other questions or comments on item seven? Any hands raised? No, nope, I don't see any hands raised. All right, let's move on to item eight. Any miscellaneous? Mandy, it's Diane again. I'm going to chime in with a very quick miscellaneous. Going back to this Wi Fi piece, is there any reason at all we're not buying some of these units tomorrow that the county can use? I can't answer that. <laughs> I don't know why we want, we have a million dollars. So I think we need to buy them and place them. And I can imagine we would find more than 120 spots for them throughout the county. But I, you know, I, if, you know, maybe we need to adjust that. Um, you know, you hate to have equipment that you have that you can't use. Um, but at the same time, we have the funding to purchase them and we could put them feasibly throughout the county. So I don't know, maybe that's a, staff uh, decision that they could 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 discuss um, you know a, a risk analysis or whatever but that's a good point any other miscellaneous just real quick chair um, this is Jim wondering if we could somehow put out to uh, local units to um, let them know that we'll be talking about this some more so that um, they could potentially offer feedback on on where we're headed. Uh, we could ask questions, et cetera. Would that make sense? Would we will, be willing to do that? Where we're headed in terms of of the whole program? No, well, or where we're headed? no the local unit reimbursement piece, um, which oh, we spent a okay. lot of time on. It well, feels a little I, bit yeah, like we're doing it in a vacuum if they're not there um, giving us direct feedback. Sure, I think we can definitely open the lines of communication, but I know Jeff has been very available and Jeff, you could probably speak to this, but I know you've had multiple conversations with all of them and this is an open meeting. Um, you know, I, and I think we've determined to, you know, further flush this out and then meet on the tent. So, you know, I don't know what we would have to report to them because not a, no additional decisions have been made today. Yeah, I would, I would guarantee if we asked them, they would all want their public safety reimbursed That's because that frees up general funds for other uses that they may see they need for COVID related responses. So that'd be the quickest and easiest way to cover, um, you know, any shortfalls or any programs they want to they wanna do because it would alleviate the general fund pressure for them. All right, thanks. Any other miscellaneous? Any other hands up? other hands raised any public comment today on item nine um, chair there is one member of the public who has his hand raised it's kendall joseph okay yep kendall are you there i wish i could see you <laughs> i am can you hear me we can hear you i can hear you yes okay are we am i able to say public comment at this point well, oh, no, I can. Can. Okay, 
My name is uh, Kendall Joseph, and I'm a co-founder for Mallowfields. We are a woman and minority-owned software products company based here in Grand Rapids. We create complex software systems for education, industry, and government. I'm here today to talk to you about the CARES Fund and its potential impact in our company. First, uh, thank you for prioritizing our community services businesses. Uh, we love them, we need them, and they need us. Thank you as well for leaving something for the rest of us who are less visible, but also necessary to produce the wealth that can be spent at these services businesses. Mallow Fields is a fledgling software products company. We are building two lines of software. The first tracks delib deliberations like this one for transparency, accountability, and better decision-making. We have used early prototypes from the beginning of our company to document our own important decisions, proposals, and votes. The second enables communities and institutions to communicate and work on projects with a major geographic element, work that uses maps. One example is helpkent.org, a detailed map of emergency food resources which we built and host for free for the Kent County Essential Needs Task Force. Another is a project underway for Plaster Creek Stewards, which the students and environmental scientists will use to inventory and map hundreds of new trees planted in the watershed and to record detailed observations of their health over time. We've grown in 18 months to five engineers with no support staff, and now we are asking for help. But if you're going to help, we need help at a different scale. We need money at 10 to 20 times the scale you have offered in the first round of emergency relief. That is our bold ask. And now I'll briefly explain why you and our community at large, whom you represent, should consider it. Like all high tech, high growth companies, Mallow Fields is fundamentally different than the local services businesses that were appropriately prioritized. Yeah, one more minute. Sorry. Here's the big reason that our requirements, scale, and impact are different. Most lo local services businesses recycle money that is already in the community. High-tech products businesses, especially software companies like ours, compete and sell with the world. The work of simply building our products concentrates talent and high-paying salaries here, even if our products fail. If our products succeed, we harvest revenues from across the country and the world and deposit them here. Most local services businesses cannot scale exponentially. A software company can increase its sales a hundredfold while its staff increases tenfold. And the profits come back here to be spent at the restaurants, barber shops, retail and industrial services companies we have been fighting to preserve throughout this crisis. Now, I know I'm out of time, but if I can, for a moment, I can volunteer a member of the community who would be willing to uh, yield the rest of their time so I can finish. Is that possible? Sure. sure. Go ahead. Are there any hands raised that would like to yield their time? I would. Please restart the timer. Consider which businesses are not in crisis right now. Zoom, Salesforce, Microsoft, and thousands of smaller, less known, but even more durable software companies that build tools for specific industries. The skilled staff they pay aren't in crisis, nor are there many service firms where software companies and their staff spend money. We're asking for your support because we are building a company like that, but we are not mature yet. If we were, we would already be helping you, not the other way around. But COVID-19, has stopped us dead in our tracks because we cannot access the face-to-face -face contacts, industry trade shows, and professional conferences that are the way in which our industry-specific products are marketed and sold. We are only still alive at all because we are selling our labor to build other people's software. Instead of working on the products that, we, that are, are our purpose, we've nearly tripled in staff in one year. If we keep spending most of our time on side projects, we might not fold, but we won't grow. But with the investment needed to focus on our core products, our minority-owned, woman-owned company could triple again. 
Finally, we're asking that you support us because we are unlike all the other high-tech, high-growth companies that we know of. We are minority and women-owned and staffed, including our engineers. Every employee is an owner. Every owner has a vote. We are building a community resource that is not for sale while spurning the billionaire's club of venture capital. If this sounds valuable, finally consider that it is expensive. To do this work, we need backhoes, not shovels. Tankers, not oil cans. We are doing our best to keep our tools and our engineers in use by building other people's roads, so to speak. Please consider investing in us so we can get back to our real purpose, building our team of local engineers as we build something real for ourselves and our city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendall, and thank you for your patience sitting through our long meetings today. I really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate your input, and um, we discussed this uh, yesterday as well. We'll continue to work on um, communication and resources uh, with you. So thank you so much. Y'all should consider timing um, your portions as well to mitigate that problem. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Any other public comment today? I don't see any hands raised and there's no messages in the inbox. All right. Seeing that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Brevi moves to adjourn. Support. Support. Yeah. Sec seconded by everyone. Um, seconded by uh, Commissioner Skaggs. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned till September 10th. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair.